Good afternoon, and welcome to the Red Rock Resort's third quarter 2020 conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Please note this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Stephen Cootie, Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Treasurer of Red Rock Resorts. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Operator, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on today's Red Rock Resorts third quarter 2020 earnings conference call. Joining me on the call today are Frank and Lorenzo Bertita, as well as members of our executive management team. I'd like to remind everyone that our call today will include forward-looking statements under the safe harbor provision of the United States federal securities laws. Developments and results may differ from those projected. During this call, we will also discuss non-GAAP financial measures. For definitions and complete reconciliation of these figures to GAAP, please refer to the financial tables in our earnings press release in Form 8K, which were filed this afternoon prior to the call. Also, please note that this call is being recorded. Let's now turn to our third quarter results. On a consolidated basis, we reported net revenue of $353.2 million, down from $465.9 million in the prior third quarter. Adjusted EBITDA of $160.9 million, up 44.8% from $111.1 million in the prior third quarter. And our EBITDA margin increased 2,171 basis points to 45.6% for the quarter. With respect to our Las Vegas operations, we reported net revenues of $320.8 million, down from $440.7 million in the prior quarter. Adjusted EBITDA of $141.7 million, up 38.6% from $102.2 million in the prior third quarter, and our EBITDA margin increased 2,997 basis points to 44.2% for the quarter. These results represent our highest third quarter adjusted EBITDA and our highest margins in any quarter in the history of our, of, our, of our operations. In order to better understand our third quarter Las Vegas performance, we think it's important to look at our results excluding the impact of our still closed properties, Texas Station, Fiesta Rancho, Fiesta Henderson, and Palms Casino Resort had on the third quarter. When viewing our third quarter Las Vegas performance excluding the still closed properties from each reporting period, we reported net revenue of $316 million, up 0.3% from $314.9 million in the prior third quarter. Adjusted EBITDA of $146.1 million, up 39.7% from $104.6 million in the prior third quarter. And our EBITDA margin increased 1,304 basis points to 46.2% for the quarter. Taking a look behind the numbers, the customer trends we saw in June continued throughout the third quarter as we saw strong visitation from a younger demographic, increased spend per visit, more time spent on device, plus increased return of our core customer. These positive trends were offset by higher COVID-related costs, costs associated with our closed properties, and continued COVID-related restrictions on our business. We expect these cross currents will continue, continue to exist for a while, and while certain of these trends clearly helped drive our record third quarter results, we should note that we are still in the middle of this pandemic and have little visibility regarding the impacts this crisis will have on our company and the Las Vegas economy moving forward. On the cost side, the company's performance continues to benefit from the decisive actions the management team took during the closure. Through a combination of streamlining our business, optimizing our marketing initiatives, and renegotiating a number of our vendor and third party agreements, we now expect annual cost reductions that will be permanently removed from the business to be greater than the $150 million in annual cost reductions we referenced on our prior call. These initiatives have resulted in a leaner, more efficient company, which will enable us to achieve and sustain higher margins and drive more free cash flow to the bottom line going forward. I will now cover a few balance sheet and capital items. The company's cash and cash equivalents at the end of the third quarter for $108.9 million, and the total principal amount of debt outstanding at quarter end was $3 billion. In the third quarter, we paid down $285.6 million in debt, and since the end of the third quarter, we've paid down an additional $53 million in debt, reducing our debt to below pre-pandemic levels, even while carrying our team members throughout the crisis. It should be highlighted that the company was able to generate approximately $124.4 million of free cash flow, or $1.06 per share in the quarter, and every dollar of that free cash flow went to pay down debt as we continue to focus on our deleveraging our balance sheet and increasing our financial flexibility during these uncertain times. Capital spend in the third quarter was $12 million, and we anticipate 
the capital expenditures for the balance of the year to be approximately $9 million, bringing our projected 2020 capital spend to be between $60 million and $65 million. And although we are still in the process of finalizing our 2021 capital budget, we anticipate that it will be between $65 million and $75 million. <coughs> Finally, an update on our two Native American projects. At Great Casino Resort, we reported management fees for the third quarter of $30.7 million, an increase of 31% from $23.5 million in the third quarter of 2019. Additionally, the tribe has agreed that the management agreements will be extended through February 4th, 2021, and we hope to reach an agreement with the tribe on an appropriate additional extension of a term past February 4th, 2021, in accordance with the terms of the management agreements. Regarding North Fork, during the quarter, the California Supreme Court finally decided the key issue in the Enterprise Tribes case favoring that tribe. The Supreme Court then remanded the North Fork case to the Appeals Court with a direction to vacate its early decision against the North Fork tribe and reconsider it in light of the Enterprise decision. Based on the favorable Supreme Court decision, we have ramped up our development efforts on this project and expect to have a shovel in the ground in the second quarter of 2021. The build expected to take an additional 15 to 18 months. While we were still working through the planning and budgeting phases of the project, complete, we expect this project to be over 213,000 square feet, including almost 100,000 square feet of casino space. Initially include 2,000 class three slots and 40 table games, two standalone restaurant concepts and a food hall concept. We are excited to begin the development of this very attractive project on behalf of the North Fork Tribe, and we'll be providing more detail as it becomes, as it becomes available. While Las Vegas is going through some very challenging times, we believe that the very favorable supply-demand dynamic, the stable regulatory environment, and the lowest gaming tax rate in the nation all serve to support our long-term view that the Las Vegas locals market is the most attractive gaming market in the United States. And with our best-in-class assets and local locations, unparalleled distribution and scale, deep organic development pipeline, and our status as one of the few gaming companies that still owns all of its assets, we remain uniquely positioned to take advantage of and thrive in this market. Lastly, we'd like to recognize and extend our thanks to all of our team members for their hard work and to our guests for their support throughout this pandemic. Operator, this concludes our prepared remarks for today, and we are now ready to take questions from participants on the call. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star than one one on your touchdown phone. If you're using a speakerphone, we ask that you please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press that star then two. Today's first question comes from Joe Graff with J.P. Morgan. Please go. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Buddy, um, I think what we're all trying to figure out is, you know, the sustainability of, of some of these impressive uh, expense reductions and, and margin gains. Can you talk about Steve and Frank how you're thinking about the sustainability of that? What, what comes back as revenues recover? Um, I'm guessing you would say, you know, 44.2% margins in Las Vegas locals market might not be sustainable. You know, what's, what's the, how do you think about the sustainability, maybe from a percentage perspective? And then the, the second part of my question also related to the locals market is, um, can you talk about how you're thinking about, um, you know, reopening, you know, some of the uh, foreclosed properties, you know, what are the guideposts and things that you're looking at to evaluate the reopening? And that's all for me. Thanks. All right, Joe, I'll, I'll start, and I know Frank and Lorenzo will probably jump in, but I can tell you we're gaining confidence each month that we continue to operate a higher margin than we have historically seen in the foreseeable future. I mean, throughout the quarter, we've been very disciplined, keeping our labor and market expenses in check, and we understand this is really the new, new normal in this uncertain demand environment. Um, as you also know, you know, the majority of our mix right now is from, you know, predominantly from gaming, which is high, you know, the high margin business, uh, which helps helps us sustain those margins. Though, that said, you know, we are looking forward to the return of some of the business that we lost due to COVID, such as hotel and catering, and some of our red revenues, which are also high margin. Yeah, I, I think we believe that there's been a, been a permanent shift in the cost structure. During the shutdown, it gave us the ability to question everything we were doing and uh, to be very cautious reopening. And I don't, I don't think we see buffets coming back anytime in the near future. Um, we really looked at delayering marketing costs and being more efficient on the marketing side, much more focused on direct relationship marketing 
um, more than mass market promotions and things of that nature. So I think we believe that there's a per permanent reduction in the kind of cost of operating the business. And then I think your second question was regarding the reopening of the properties. Well, we still don't have a definitive timeline. We're still taking the time to gain the visibility of this, you know, the effect of this pandemic may have on our company as well as the, uh, the Las Vegas economy. But we have good distribution throughout the market right now. We're seeing good crossover play from the properties that are closed in the facilities that we currently have open. And maybe just to follow up to that, Frank, if, if this revenue and expense environment sustains, sustains itself for the next six months, it, it, six months. Is, is that an environment in which you would then consider reopening or you would just continue maintaining the status quo in terms of the number of properties? We're going to continue to reevaluate, but we really like what we saw this last quarter. I can tell you that. <laughs> Lorenzo, you have anything to add? Yeah, no, if you look at consolidated gaming revenues, I think they were up a tick versus last year when we had 10, 10 properties. So, you know, when you're driving that gaming revenue through um, six facilities versus 10, you're getting that. Uh, natural flow through, which obviously drives margin and profitability. So uh, we like what we're, what we're seeing uh, we, that we saw in the third quarter, and uh, we'll continue to reevaluate as, as things move ahead. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Carlos Santorelli with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Steve, you had mentioned the supply and demand dynamic. I'm, I'm not sure if this is exactly what you were referring to, but do you guys have any sense of what kind of gaming supply in the locals market looks like on a year-over-year -year basis, kind of in, in the 3Q, or what that looked like in terms of, uh, you know, units online, units offline, properties open, properties closed from your peers, and, and maybe some of the other kind of, um, you know, outside of the, the core, core casino, slot machines, things like that, what that looks like year-over-year? I mean, clearly the market has shrunk, but I'll get you. I can come back to you with specific detail. When just us alone, we've kept four, four uh, properties closed, and you, you heard yes on yesterday's call that our, you know, one of our main competitors also had several properties closed. So the locals market has shrunk. But when we're talking about demand, I mean, you have growing population, you have tax refugees moving from neighboring states into Las Vegas. Home sales are unbelievably strong. There's very little supply of homes in the market with high demand. And as population continues to grow, we control literally almost all the supply where you could even build a new locals casino. So it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic to have the limits on supply with growing demand at the same time. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. And if I could just, just ask one follow-up. Um, if you guys think about it just in the opened assets, uh, I'm not talking about the, the portfolio that's offline, but if you think about the opened assets and the revenue by vertical, i.e. if you're thinking about the casino footprint relative to the restaurants, relative to the hotels, et cetera, with the changes that you've made from a cost structure perspective, um, what do you think that the headroom is kind of relative to 2019 same store revenue? Is it, are, are you able to get 95 percent, 90, 95 percent of revenue with, with your buffets closed and maybe more limited F&B offering and some of the other amenities closed if, if everything else kind of escalated back to, you know, 100 percent of what it was in 2019, albeit the gaming floor, hotel, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, I think you can. I mean, we're close to almost 80% right now, right? Uh, the way this all, this all stands, and we're still dealing with capacity constraints on the restaurants. Um, and also wanted to think about some of the more profitable lines of business that you know have been really restrained relative to COVID. When you think of hotel, catering, theaters, um, those re represent a significant portion of our revenue, but also would be a significant portion of our profit, almost to the extent of about 12 million dollars. When you think of all the let's call it the lines of business that have been restricted due to COVID. Understood. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone. And our next question today comes from Steve Wysinski with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. Um, so not sure if you're comment on this or not, but can you, can you talk about maybe what you, you saw through or what you've seen so far through October, and has that been kind of similar, similar trends to what you saw throughout the third quarter? Yeah, Steve, this is going to be a tough one to answer because, as you recall, we did give some guidance on July, but that was really very specific, you know, kind of situation and time where we only had 26 operating days, uh, you know, throughout uh, the quarter to comment on. So 
um, I think we'll go back to our current policy and not talk about operating performance in the current quarter. Okay, understood. Um, second question, you know, I think the casino revenue side makes sense in terms of why that was so strong, but I think what was somewhat surprising to us was actually the hotel side of things, um, you know, obviously with a significant lower room count than where you were a year ago, but is there any way to help us think about, you know, maybe who's using those rooms at this point and how much are those are, you know, being used on a, on a promotional basis versus kind of a cash rate? It's very little co-comp. And so what you have seen is kind of that natural transition of, you know, we've lost a lot of group nights, and so group nights are down significantly in the third quarter. But what they've been really replaced uh, replaced by has been a lot of transient and FIT business, which has been very great for the business. So it's really the drive. You know, one of the things, you know, this is a, a business that's not really relying on airlift. It's not relying on conventions or meeting. And so we're really relying on local and drive-in traffic, which has been, you know. And while we're missing profit from hotel and catering, we're really a gaming company at the end of the day. I mean, we're 80%, 70%, 80% of our revenues and profits come from slots and table games and gaming. So we look forward to the hotel and the catering returning, and they're profitable for us. But the results show you that we can still make money, money even in this environment. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. And our next question today comes from Sean Kelly with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just uh, two questions. First, to kind of stick with the, the P&L, um, you know, Steve, when we look at the casino operating expenses, I mean, they were they were down 35% year over year, but obviously, um, you know, revenues are, are flat, you know, for the whole company. Uh, it's pretty astounding. Could, could you just give us any more color on, you know, specifically maybe what's going on in the casino floor? Is that, you know, purely labor? Is there anything else uh, that you're able to do? I mean, obviously the closed properties are going to factor in here, but it just seems pretty stunning to get that much operating leverage on the casino line item specifically. We basically went back to the basics of the fact that we have the best locations and the best properties and went back to focusing on just direct the relationships with the customer and really focused on delayering and being more efficient in our promotions and marketing. Steve? No, I would agree with that. And, and Sean, you touched on the, uh, the other pieces, right? You know, we've become much more efficient on the labor floor, um, and we've been able to funnel quite a bit of crossover play from what was 10 large properties into six. Yeah, and we have become more efficient from a labor and a scheduling standpoint, but at the same time, we're also bearing the cost of additional operating expenses and labor due to the safety precautions related to COVID. You know, so so every entrance we have, you know, somebody taking temperatures and and obviously a, a significantly higher crew of people going through the casino constantly cleaning as well. So while we're able to be more efficient on the labor side, that's we're doing that at the same time while bearing a higher higher expense due to COVID. And we're obviously hoping that doesn't last forever. And you go back to the fact that our gaming revenues are basically up slightly, but we have four less facilities and the expenses associated with those facilities and them operating. And Nevada is the one state where you have the most operating leverage of every dollar in gaming win being, you know, flow through down to the EBITDA line with uh, the tax rate that you have here in Nevada. Thank you for all the, the color. And then my follow-up would just be, you know, the, the free cash flow conversion was also, you know, really, you know, was, it was quite high in the quarter. You know, how should we think about sort of that ratio of, let's call it EBITDA to free cash flow going forward? Um, you know, specifically, I think, Steve, you called out uh, a bit of the CapEx plan, which doesn't sound dramatically different. So can we see these types of ratios kind of going forward? Anything we should be aware of in that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you're talking about a 78%, I think, ratio is what you're referring to. So when you think about our cash flow, um, from a tax perspective, you know, we're not going to be a taxpayer in 2020, most likely not be a taxpayer from 2021. Working capital should be almost a zero to positive sum game as we're still receiving some benefit from the CARES Act in terms of cash. Uh, and as we mentioned, CapEx, about 65 to 75 million. So Lorenzo, Frank, we have no deferred, have made, you know, created these assets, there's no deferred capital maintenance. And so now I think we're reaping the reward of that, of that program that we've done in the past. And so we're going to be very disciplined about the capital focus. And then a cash interest expense as we're starting to pay down debt um, should be in that 110 to 120 range in terms of million. So you can kind of figure that in. But, I, you know, we should have a, a very high 
uh, free cash flow to EBITDA yield. Thank you all. And our next question today comes from Barry Jonas with True Securities. Please. Hi, guys. Uh, for starters, where are you guys on potential land sales? I think some land in Reno was reportedly for sale at one point. Uh, what, what's the latest there and overall, I guess? Barry, this is Rod at Seaman. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're gradually making uh, good progress on those sales. Um, you mentioned the Reno property in particular. We have, have uh, an 88-acre piece up there at the Mount Rose property that's been on the market. And, uh, again, we're making progress there. We'll, we'll uh, notify you when we actually close on land sales. Um, you know, these things are can tend to have some long and entitlement periods at times, and um, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're sure they're, they're closing before we make any announcements. So um, with respect to the convention center site, specifically in Reno, we are still um, evaluating that for future development. Um, um, but overall, very positive and uh, constructive on the unsolicited interest we're getting across our portfolio for excess property. Got it. Great. And then, uh, you know, Steve, in your comments, you talked about uh, maybe a second gradient extension. And just curious if you can give more color. You know, I think um, stuff like that is, is usually less common in terms of longer term extensions. So is, is, is the intent something more short term to get through COVID or, or are you hoping to do something really more long term? Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to turn that over to my esteemed colleague, Jeff Welch. Uh, hi. Yeah, so we're not um, expecting a kind of full-on re-up of the uh, management agreement, not, not even remotely. Um, all we are talking about is a provision in the, in the management agreements, and there are gaming and non-gaming management agreements at Graydon that basically say that the term of the management agreement will be extended um, by a period equal to um, the, a period that starts on the date of the original closure and ends when substantially all the amenities are turned back on. And uh, at Grayton, uh, we do not believe uh, substantially all of the amenities have been turned back on yet. So, um, you know, a, an extension much longer than the, the three months that, that the tribe has already agreed to, we believe is warranted. Great. And then just last one for me, you know, you guys have always thought of as a leader in uh, gaming floor technology. Curious to get your views on uh, cashless gaming. I think, you know, at, at the, at, through this crisis, this one thing is said is to, you know, give the customers what they want, and, you know, cashless is definitely something they want. So you can anticipate that we are working heavily to produce a cashless solution and a one-wallet solution for the casino, um, and we expect to uh, introduce that next year. Great. Thanks so much, and congratulations. And our next question today comes from Jared Sojain with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, can you just tell us if, you, if you've seen any impact on demand or revenue since the capacity limit was raised from 50 people to 250 people? Because I, I could see an argument for being positive, obviously, but even negative, frankly, if it opens up other leisure alternatives. Has that been meaningful in any way over the last few weeks? It's really, it's really just happened recently. I think... Um, we do think it certainly is a positive for us moving forward, particularly in um, the social catering side. You know, there's been a lot of delayed weddings, uh, small groups, things of that nature, which we typically um, cater to, especially here, obviously, in the local regional market. So, you know, once again, it, it's been fairly, fairly recent since that's gone in place, but we would expect that to uh, be a net positive for us moving forward and in 21. Okay, thank you. And then I guess along the same uh, line of thinking there, can you just give us some insight into the talks you've been having with governmental officials or maybe what you've been hearing just concerning the risk that capacity limitations get tightened again or even worse, risk of another shutdown? Um, I think the latest that we have heard, I think the governor came out yesterday and in fact talked about, you know, in early 21 potentially moving to 50% capacity for meetings and convention and groups and things of that nature. So we took that as a, a, a positive sign looking forward into 21. Um, other than that, we haven't, haven't heard anything relative to any restrictions 
um, or anything like that. Okay. Jared, Thank you very much. There is, and just to add to the, the flip side of that, Jared, as you as we mentioned, we've paid down pretty much the entire revolver, so we have about a, over a billion dollars of liquidity. And as mentioned on previous calls, even with carrying all of our employees, you know, our burn rate was a little bit south of fifty fifty million dollars. If we went to something more draconian, our burn rate's south of thirty million dollars, which gives us almost three three years of run rate. Thank you. Our next question today comes from Chad Bainon with Macquarie. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for, for taking my question. Um, given your, your free cash flow uh, generation and, and really just the recovery that we're talking about here, how, how are you guys thinking about returning to um, paying a dividend? And can you just remind us on the restrictions from a covenant standpoint? Yeah, sure. And so I think the, what the, the board evaluates the payment of the, re, the allocation of capital, particularly the dividend every quarter. Um, right now, there's no definitive timeline, but I can you know, rest assured that you know, you, our larger, you know, our larger shareholders uh, are aligned with everyone else. Um, in terms of the covenants, um, there are significant um, ways to move the dividend to to, to restart the dividend, um, as there are specific carve-outs related to the dividend. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and then regarding your uh, older-aged customer cohort. Um, did you see any recovery in that segment as we kind of move through the quarter, or is that um, older age customer, you know, still not really participating um, at the at the properties at this point? It's Lorenzo. We we did start to see the older age um, customer um, start to come back to the properties, particularly uh, kind of around Labor Day and after Labor Day. We really started to see uh, more of a pickup. Up. So um, the answer is yes. Thank you, guys. Nice quarter. And ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, to ask a question, please press star than one. Our next question comes from Stephen Grambling with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Perhaps the, the flip side of Chad's question on the older customer, I think one of the concerns out there is that if other forms of entertainment come back, the new younger customers are going to get um, – you know, a look elsewhere and that marketing may have to come back. Can you expand on how th that customer profile, you know, is changing and how they may be engaging with your marketing similar or different to what has historically been the core rated player? Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, we have seen, you know, a younger demographic for sure. Well, we've been um, doing a good, good job on getting them to sign up for exactly. the loyalty program so that we can have relationship marketing with them going forward. And I think if you look at the amenity packages that we have, particularly at Red Rock and Green Valley, the food and beverage offerings there already kind of cater to um, that younger crowd, whether it be, you know, Blue Ribbon Sushi at Red Rock, Hearthstone, new Italian restaurant that we have there, T-Bones, and then a number of restaurants that Click Hospitality ha has put in place for us at Green Valley Ranch. So we do feel like that relative to the locals market that we have the best amenities really to attract that uh, upper end younger um, kind of you know working mobile mobile demographics so and, and would you generally say that the way that they're engaging from a play standpoint follows a similar path to that older demographic when they first come in um, this is one quick follow-up I mean, that, that, I mean, that's a tough one to answer. I can't tell you that, you know, that segment of the market is our fat, one of our fastest growing segments of all the, of the segments within our database. Got it. It's helpful. That's it for me. Thanks so much. And hey, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the conference back over, over to the management team for any final remarks. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we look forward to talking to you about 90 days. Thank you, sir. This concludes today's conference call. We thank you all for attending today's presentation. You may notice nicer lines and have a wonderful day.